Hi Year 12, this is part two of our proof rock videos. Um, we're going to move on now um, into our next stanza. Um, we start with, um, indeed there will be time. It's arguably a religious allusion to Ecclesiastes 3.8 um, where it says that there is time for everything. It could also be an allusion to Marvel's To His Coy Mistress, uh, which starts um, Had We But World Enough and Time. But in this case, it's done ironically because Proof Rock becomes the coy one. We get this idea that Proof Rock has wasted time in his life, but is convinced he still has time. It becomes about procrastination. We then move in to the continuation of our yellow smoke imagery and the feline fog cat if you will. For the yellow smoke that slides along the street, notice the sibilance there of the um, repeated S's to give that slith slithering sense. For the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes, there will be time. There will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate time for you and time for me and again that time for you time for me could also be an allusion to marvels to his coy mistress notice the repetition of the time there uh, and then the fragmentations preparing a face to meet the faces the hands um, and then the development of the motif of time comes through um, but that repetition of um there will be time, there will be time. Who is he trying to convince here? Is he trying to convince the person that he's speaking to? Is he trying to convince the reader? Or is it something else? And then to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. Feeling that he has to put a mask on to meet these people. Uh, is it about his social ineptness and that he can't meet people? No, he, he never actually speaks of people. He speaks of their faces, not of the person behind the face. And so we get some more fragmentation here and the idea of a mask and it becomes more superficial. And then he moves on to there will be time to murder and create and time for all the works and days of hands that lift a drip, drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me and time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred revisions and revisions before the taking of toast and tea. So uh, where he has, there will be time to murder and create. Is it death and birth, birth as artistry, birth as creativity or something else? Then those revisions and decisions or indecisions it's uncertain. Uh, it's, it's very different to when we get to preludes where we have the certain certainties. Here we have uncertainty. And his whole life is like this. Uh, when he talks about there will be time for, for all the words and days, it's an allusion to Hesod's poem, Work and Days, uh, which is a Greek poem. And it's uh, this poem privilege, privileges a life of work, not a pointless life. So perhaps it's an ironic allusion. Note also the taking of toast and tea and also the repetition of time, 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 time. You have that alliteration of the t sound, the t, t, t. We get the ticking of a clock that's coming through the alliteration. And so as time is moving on, so is this clock here. Notice as well, um, and all, and time for all the works and days of hands. Hands, again, it's another fragment. The hands take us back to the overwhelming question that we had earlier, but we still don't know what the question is. And it as well foreshadows the reference to Hamlet and John the Baptist that comes later when he says that lift and drop a question on your plate. But what is that question? And then we have the uh, before the taking of toast and tea. It's mundane, it's routine, it's what he does every day. Contrast against the indecisions about time, he's deep in, in anxiety and inaction. Ironically, he thinks he has time, but it's played by indecision, so he doesn't actually have time. So it suggests a pathological in insecurity there. 
And then we have that repetition of the refrain. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. He doesn't interact with them though. Notice that they're moving in, they're moving out and that refrain keeps coming and going structurally just the same as the women come and go and the women, as the women do. So again, we're taking back to that pseudo-intellectual uh, elements of the earlier part of the poem, back to that pretentiousness, to the life of taking tea, being routine, talking about art and literature. Um, it the lines that the women in the room, the women come and go talking to Michelangelo echoes uh, the works of Jules Leverg, who is an influencer of T.S. Eliot's writing. And then we move on. And indeed, there will be time. Do I dare? So indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin, my morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. So the do I dare, do I dare, is it a desire to act tempered by uncertainty in his insecurities? What will be the consequence for not acting? It seems to be full of regrets and frustration. Should he ask the overwhelming question from stanza one? He has time to climb the stairs, time to change his mind and time to return again. It suggests a lack of self-confidence. He's concerned everyone will look at him. Again, he's referring to himself in fragments, his hair, arms, legs. And we get this sense that he's feared, he fears being mocked, even though he's dressed respectfully. But like the crab that's to come in the later stanzas, he wears his his clothing like an exoskeleton from feet to chin and it highlights his boarding head, his arms and his legs being thin. The use of the word firmly suggests it's suffocating him as well. And how his hair is growing thin. It's a split consciousness. He's acutely aware of what he's thinking, but also thinking about what others are thinking of him and judging him. He's worried about losing weight, looking old, becoming bald. And then we get back to that profound question, do I dare disturb the universe? Do I dare have self-determination, taking action to do so? So we get this imagery of him stuck on the stairs trying to work out, does he go up, does he go down, what does he do? And we get back to that overwhelming question and then we start to think, you know, is it a proposal of marriage? And if so, is it the fear of rejection that's paralysing him? Originally when the poem was written, it was titled Proof Rock Among the Women. Is he confessing his love for one of the superficial women who is coming and going, talking to Michelangelo? Would he be disrupting the universe if he proposes? But that night might not be the question at all, and it's up to you to determine what you think that it might mean. And then in a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. He's so close to acting to disturb the universe, but he falters. I have time later. But the revisions, is this a meta moment? Are we actually discussing Eliot's own writing of the poem? And then it moves on. For I've known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I've measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voice is dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And so we have this sense of what does that mean? Known them all. Who has he known? We have the, the dying with a dying fall. That's an allusion to Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, the lovesick or scene with Prufrock, which Prufrock isn't. Um, uh, in Twelfth Night we have music is the food of love. But Prufrock can only overhear it from a distance. The voices fade away. He's only experiencing love through observing or overhearing others. Mornings, evenings, tea and coffee with people and um, the measurement of his life with tea parties and the spoons that he has used. So he reduces his whole life to a trivial matter here, to spoons. So he becomes stuck in his own inertia. He can't communicate to others. He has so many questions that he doesn't act on or answer. And then I've known the eyes already. So we're still fragmented. We have this motif of time coming the whole way through. 
And then this um, moment of um, I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase and when I'm formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I'm pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the buttons of my days and ways and how should I presume? So the eyes are sprawling on a pin, they've met him. The, the women, if it's the women that he's talking about, have met him and he can't move, he's stuck. And he doesn't know what to do. He says, how should I begin? How should I presume? He ends up being discarded like a cigarette butt. And then he's asking, then how should he act? How can he begin anew? I've known the arms already, known them all. Arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight down with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl? And should I then presume... And how should I should I, should I begin? It's quite sensory the um, and sensuous the imagery here. And again, it's fragmented. We're talking about body parts. We've got the eyes, the eyes. So it's a use of the definitive article, a definite article. Is it specific? Is it the eyes of women, or is it a metaphor of society, an uncompassionate society at that? But those eyes watch and judge him. They trap him, pin him. He becomes a specimen, a bug or an insect used for scientific purposes. They see his life as the butt end, the waste. He doesn't know how to ask the questions anymore. Descriptions of the women are just fragments, not a whole woman. We've got the hairs, the arms. And how does he connect to these women? He seems to be objectifying the women by only focusing on their body parts. They're white, they're bare, virginal. But in the lamplight, notice it's the lamplight, that lamplight gets repeated in um, Rhapsody when we do that. He sees the brown hairs on the arms. Does this somehow make them dirty and perhaps ruined, not virginal? Or is the light, the lamp, the diffused light doing something with his vision? Have a look at preludes and how we look at vision in preludes and see if you can draw links there. So his obsession with these women in their body parts becomes a little bit disturbing, actually. And then you have to ask, is there some kind of arousal here? That makes me so digress. He admits he's digressing. He's moving away from whatever it is that we're doing in this poem. Uh, so I'm going to pause it there um, so that we can then go into part three.